I'm Rachel, a 32-year-old who used to think that fairy tales had happy ends. When I met Mark, the guy who would become my husband, three years ago my life took an unexpected turn. This is our story, an apparently flawless marriage serving as the backdrop for a journey of love, trust, and ultimately betrayal. I was destined to find the Corner Cafe on a typical Tuesday morning. Holding a John Grisham book, I became engrossed in the realm of legal thrillers. At that point, Mark showed up. It didn't take long to notice him. Although he exuded confidence, there was an enticing warmth to his smile. Hi, is that the most recent work by Grisham? He inquired, gesturing to my book. His tone was kind and full of sincere interest. Yes, I've just started, I replied, pleasantly surprised by how easy our discussion flowed. He's always a good read. We struck up a conversation that flowed as we discussed our favorite authors. Mark had a funny and charming sense of humor that always made me smile. Ours picked up speed, making us feel more like two newly acquainted acquaintances than old buddies catching up. In the weeks that followed, Mark and I grew closer. Our shared interests in music, particularly old jazz, and a mutual love for exploring hidden bookstores around the city cemented our bond. He was charming, respectful, and attentive. I found myself eagerly anticipating our dates, each encounter leaving me more enchanted. One evening as we walked along the river, Mark's tone turned serious. Rachel, I've never felt this way before. I think I'm falling for you, he confessed under the dim glow of the streetlights. His words sent a rush of warmth through me. I feel the same, Mark. You're unlike anyone I've ever met. I admitted, my heart racing with excitement and a hint of fear. Six months flew by, and our relationship only grew stronger. It was during a cozy dinner at my apartment when Mark proposed. The moment was simple yet profoundly sincere. There was no hesitation in my yes. I loved him, and I believed in our future together. The joy of our engagement, however, was soon met with apprehension as the time came to meet Mark's parents. His mother, Linda, was a stern woman with piercing eyes that seemed to judge my every move. His father was more amiable, but there was an undeniable seriousness to him, especially regarding the institution of marriage. During a formal dinner at their house, Mark's father brought up the subject of a prenuptial agreement. It's just practical, he stated matter-of-factly. The request caught me off guard, but given my past experience with a cheating ex-boyfriend, I understood the necessity. I agree, but I have a condition, I said, steadying my voice. If either of us cheats, the cheater owes the other $100,000. Mark's expression was a mix of surprise and respect. I promise, Rachel, I'd never cheat on you, he said earnestly. I wanted to believe him, to trust that this time my heart was safe. Our wedding was a beautiful affair filled with laughter, dancing, and promises of forever. The first year of our marriage felt like living in a dream. We traveled to romantic destinations, enjoyed quiet evenings at home, and supported each other's ambitions. Mark was not just my husband, he was my best friend, my confidant. After the whirlwind of our wedding, Mark and I settled into married life with an ease that surprised even me. Our first year was like living in a bubble of happiness, untouched by the outside world. Our honeymoon in Paris was a dream. Strolling along the scene, we were just two lovebirds lost in a city of love. Can you believe we're here? I asked Mark one evening as we watched the Eiffel Tower light up. He pulled me close and said, With you, I can believe anything. This is just the start for us, Rachel. Those days were filled with laughter, romantic dinners, and promises of a future together. We returned home with a suitcase full of memories and a bond that felt unbreakable. Back home, our days found a comfortable routine. Mark would kiss me goodbye every morning before heading to work, and I'd be waiting with dinner when he got back. We talked about everything and nothing, our conversation stretching late into the night. One night, as we were cleaning up after dinner, Mark said, You know, I never thought I'd be this happy just doing mundane stuff like washing dishes. 
I playfully splashed some water at him. That's because you've got an amazing wife. It's all about good company, he laughed, catching the water in his hands. Absolutely. Best decision of my life, marrying you. Despite our happiness, there was a growing pressure from outside, the expectation of starting a family. At family gatherings, Mark's mom, Linda, would often drop not-so-subtle hints. So when are we going to hear some good news? Linda asked one Sunday lunch, her tone laced with expectation. I tried to brush it off with a joke. Oh, you'll be the first to know when there's news. But her persistence grew over time and started to strain me. Mark noticed my discomfort but reassured me, don't let my mom get to you. We'll start a family when we're ready, not a minute sooner. Despite these pressures, our first year of marriage was magical. We celebrated our first anniversary with a quiet dinner at home. Mark surprised me with a necklace I had admired months ago. Happy anniversary, Rachel. Here's to many more years of happiness, he said, his eyes shining with love. I felt tears prick my eyes as I said, Thank you, Mark. I couldn't have asked for a better partner in life. That night, as we cuddled on the couch, I couldn't help but feel incredibly lucky. I had a husband who loved me, a cozy home, and a future that seemed bright. As our second year of marriage began, the pressure from Mark's family, especially his mother Linda, started to take a toll on me. It wasn't just about starting a family anymore. Her criticisms seeped into every aspect of our lives. Linda had a way of making her disapproval known, often under the guise of helpful comments. Every visit became a nightmare for me. One afternoon, as I was setting the table for lunch, she walked into the kitchen and eyed the spread with a disapproving frown. Is this what you're serving? A bit simple, don't you think? Linda remarked, her tone dripping with disdain. I clenched my jaw, trying to maintain my composure. I thought we'd enjoy something light today. She just sniffed, muttering under her breath about proper meals and good housekeeping. Her comments weren't just confined to my cooking. She found fault in everything I did, from the way I decorated the house to how I spent my free time. Nothing was off limits. One evening, while Mark and I were relaxing in the living room, Linda decided to give her unsolicited opinion. You know, Rachel, if Mark gave me the money he spends on you, I could hire a proper cleaner and a cook. Mark looked uncomfortable, but didn't say anything. His silence felt like a betrayal. I was seething but managed to say, Well, Linda, I'm doing my best here. What hurt the most was how Mark's attitude started to change. He began echoing his mother's criticisms, albeit in a more subtle way. After one of Linda's visits, Mark casually mentioned, Mom might have a point about the house. Maybe we should consider getting some help. I felt a pang of hurt and frustration. So you think I can't handle it either? I asked, my voice trembling. No, that's not what I meant. He backed but the damage was done. The constant criticisms and Mark's growing detachment were straining our marriage. We started having arguments over trivial things, our once easy conversations turning into tense exchanges. After a particularly heated argument, I found myself wondering aloud, what happened to us, Mark? We used to be on the same team. He ran a hand through his hair, looking frustrated. I don't know, Rachel. It's just everything feels so complicated now. I went to bed that night feeling lonely and misunderstood. Linda's insidious comments had not only invaded my home, but were also creeping into my marriage, leaving me to wonder if the love Mark and I shared was strong enough to withstand this constant barrage of negativity. As the third year of our marriage rolled in, a sense of unease began to settle in my heart. The once bright flame of our love seemed to flicker under the shadow of doubt and mistrust. It started with a phone call, or rather, several of them. A name kept popping up on Mark's phone, Jake. I couldn't help but notice how Mark's demeanor changed whenever that name flashed on the screen. One evening, while we were watching TV, his phone rang again, Jake. The screen flashed. Mark quickly silenced it and put the phone away, but not before I saw the nervous glance he threw my way. Who's Jake? 
I asked, trying to sound casual, but my heart was pounding. Oh, just a new guy at work. No one important, Mark replied, but his voice was too nonchalant, his answer too rehearsed. Mark's behavior began to change. He started coming home late from work, his excuses flimsy and inconsistent. His wardrobe underwent a transformation too, from casual to sharply tailored suits. Working late again, I questioned one night as he prepared to leave, noticing his dressed-up appearance. Yeah, a big project, he said without meeting my eyes. Don't wait up. One day, my frustration boiled over. As Mark was about to leave for another late night at work, I confronted him. This isn't like you, Mark. What's really going on? I demanded, my voice trembling with a mixture of anger and fear. Mark sighed, his expression a mix of guilt and annoyance. I told you it's just work. Why can't you trust me? Because you're hiding something. You're never here, and when you are, it's like you're a million miles away. I shot back, my eyes stinging with tears. Mark didn't respond. He just grabbed his coat and left, leaving me standing there, feeling more alone than ever. That night, lying in our empty bed, I made a decision. I couldn't live in this limbo of doubt and suspicion. I needed to know the truth, whatever it was. The next morning, I called a private detective. It felt like a betrayal, but the constant worry and uncertainty were eating me alive. I needed answers, and I was determined to get them, no matter what they revealed about the man I thought I knew. The days after contacting the private detective were a haze of anxiety and anticipation. I felt like I was walking on a tightrope, trying to maintain a semblance of normalcy while my world was quietly crumbling around me. Then the call came, and with it, the shattering of my last hope. Mrs. Johnson, we have conclusive evidence. I'm afraid your suspicions were correct. The detective's voice was solemn, heavy with the weight of the news he was delivering. He explained that Mark had been having an affair. The mysterious Jake on his phone was actually a woman. My heart sank as he detailed their meetings, providing timestamps and photos. It was irrefutable. I sat there, phone in hand, feeling a mix of devastation and vindication. My worst fears weren't just fears anymore. They were cold, hard facts. Despite the pain, I decided not to confront Mark immediately. I needed more than just the evidence of his infidelity. I needed to understand the full extent of his deceit. One evening, as I was passing by his home office, I overheard a conversation that chilled me to the bone. Mark was talking to his mother, Linda. Mom, I'm planning to end it with Rachel after your birthday. Mark's voice was cold, devoid of any affection he once had for me. Oh, that's wise, dear. Make sure she gets me a nice 65th birthday present before you drop the bomb, Linda replied, her voice laced with a callousness that took my breath away. I leaned against the wall, feeling nauseous. Not only was my husband unfaithful, but he and his mother were plotting against me, waiting to use me for one last expensive gift before discarding me. Fueled by a mixture of anger and resolve, I decided to play along. I continued as if nothing was wrong while secretly gathering more evidence of Mark's infidelity. The detective provided me with everything, photos, videos, and even audio recordings. I was building my case, preparing for the moment I would strike back. As I lay in bed each night next to the man who had betrayed me, a plan began to form in my mind. I would wait until after Linda's birthday. I would give them the illusion of victory, let them think they had outsmarted me. But when they least expected it, I would reveal everything and turn the tables. As Linda's 65th birthday approached, I put on a mask of ignorance, acting as though everything was normal. Inside, I was a cauldron of emotions, anger, betrayal, and a fierce determination to see my plan through. A few days before the birthday, Linda casually mentioned her upcoming celebration during a family dinner. So, Rachel, I'm expecting a grand 65th birthday. You must have planned something special for me, she said with a saccharine smile, clearly anticipating a lavish gift. Keeping my emotions in check, I replied with faint enthusiasm, 
of course, Linda. I've arranged a dinner at the city's most luxurious restaurant. It'll be a night to remember. Her eyes lit up with glee, not realizing the trap I was setting. Oh, how wonderful. I can't wait. Just a small family gathering, right? Yes, very intimate and exclusive, just for close family, I confirmed, my words laced with hidden irony. Later that night, Mark approached me, a hint of suspicion in his voice. That's quite a generous plan for Mum's birthday. Are you sure about this? I looked at him, maintaining my composure. Absolutely. It's a significant birthday, and I want to do something special for her. Mark seemed appeased, but I could tell he was puzzled by my willingness to indulge his mother. As the day of the dinner drew near, I took care of the final arrangements. I confirmed the booking in Linda's name, rechecked the guest list, and made sure everything was set for the grand evening. I was playing the dutiful wife and daughter-in-law, but underneath the facade, I was ready to expose the betrayal and deceit that had been festering in our marriage. The night before the dinner, as I lay in bed, I couldn't help but feel a twisted sense of satisfaction. I was hours away from turning the tables on Mark and Linda. They thought they were using me for one last benefit before discarding me. Little did they know, I was the one controlling the game now. The evening of Linda's 65th birthday was set in a luxurious restaurant. Every detail was meticulously planned to reflect the grandeur of the occasion. As Linda reveled in the opulence, I played the part of the gracious daughter-in-law, masking my inner turmoil with a practiced smile. As the dinner drew to a close, the waiter presented the bill, $4,500. I reached for my card with a steady hand, my heart pounding in my chest. After swiping the card, I glanced around the table, seeing Linda's satisfied smirk and Mark's uneasy expression. Thank you for such a wonderful evening, Rachel. This is truly generous, Linda said, her voice dripping with insincerity. It was then that Mark leaned in, his voice laced with mockery. By the way, Rachel, I want a divorce. The words hit me like a physical blow, but I refused to let them see my pain. Linda, seizing the moment, chimed in sharply. Well then, I guess you should leave. This is a family gathering, after all. Without a word, I stood up and left the restaurant, my dignity intact, despite the turmoil inside. As I walked away, I pulled out my phone and swiftly canceled the payment. Then, with a few more taps, I blocked the shared account. Mark couldn't cover the cost either. Back at home, I packed my belongings quickly, the finality of my actions setting in. I was leaving this chapter of my life behind, stepping into an uncertain but hopeful future. Soon, my phone erupted with calls. I answered, and Linda's voice, shrill with rage and panic, filled my ears. The payment didn't go through. The restaurant staff called the police. What have you done? Her words were a cacophony of anger and disbelief, but I remained silent, letting her tirade wash over me. This was their doing, their betrayal and manipulation coming back to haunt them. After hanging up, I looked around the empty house, a place once filled with dreams and love, now just a hollow shell. I took a deep breath, stepped out the door, and didn't look back. Their calls continued, a desperate plea for help that I no longer felt obliged to answer. I had made my move, exposed their deceit, and now it was time for me to rebuild away from the lies and the pain that had defined my life for far too long. After leaving my marital home, I spent a restless night at a friend's place, my mind racing with what needed to be done next. The morning sun brought with it a sense of clarity and determination. It was time for the final confrontation. I arrived at the house to find Mark and Linda waiting, their faces a mix of anger and confusion, clutching the divorce papers and the evidence of Mark's infidelity. I steeled myself for the battle ahead. Linda was the first to break the silence, her voice dripping with scorn. So you've come crawling back after embarrassing us like that? I met her gaze, unflinching. I'm not here to crawl. I'm here for a divorce. Mark, who announced our divorce a day ago, suddenly tried to win everything back. 
Rachel, can't we talk about this? It was a mistake. I cut him off, holding up the evidence. Save it, Mark. Your mistake was ongoing and well documented. Linda scoffed, trying to regain control. You think you can just walk away and leave us with nothing? You're nothing without us. I laid the divorce papers on the table. Actually, it's you who will be leaving me with something. According to our print-up, Mark owes me $100,000 for his infidelity. Mark's face went pale, and Linda's eyes widened in shock as they scrambled to respond. I felt a weight lifting off my shoulders. This was it, the end of the lies, the deceit, and the pain. You can try to fight this, but the evidence is clear. I suggest you pay up and move on, I said, my voice steady. Linda had lost her customary boldness and was dumbfounded, while Mark appeared defeated. I turned and left the house without saying anything more, feeling a sense of liberation as the door closed behind me. The subsequent appeals and calls were ignored. I had permanently closed that chapter of my life. They ultimately had to pay. Although Mark needed to borrow money from his parents, I didn't give a damn where it came from. It provided some little comfort for the betrayal, but more than anything it brought finality. I felt at ease when I signed the final paperwork while sitting in the attorney's office. Despite the difficult journey filled with heartbreak and betrayal, I emerged stronger and more resilient. Feeling liberated, I ventured outside into the daylight, eager to begin afresh. Though everything remained unclear, I might still influence the future. I felt like I was finally entering the like after all the darkness.